Shonen Jump publishes a lot of manga, and I mean a lot of manga, to the point that looking for a new ongoing series can be hard. So what's the best method to choose your next pick? Well, I kind of just chose three random from the front page of the site. Now, I don't read a lot of ongoing series as I've had some bad experience with manga either getting axed or going on hiatus, but today will be different as I ahem, handpick three series that will hopefully, maybe, possibly, will be staples of this generation in Shonen Jump magazine. And just as a heads up, all these series have about 14 chapters-ish published so far, and I think that's enough to kind of gauge how the story will shape out in the future. So without further ado, let's start with the first pick. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. So I'm going to start with kind of a cheat manga first, because I knew about the series beforehand from all the memes. But even then, it kind of left me even more confused on what it was even about. So, Kagurabachi is a standard battle series surrounding the theming of magical swords in a world of mafia-like sorcerer groups. Our main character, Chihiro, is the son of a swordsmith who single-handedly attributed to the creation of massively powerful heavenly swords, which gave an upper hand in an ongoing war and bringing it to an end. With these swords being widely sought after, it was only a matter of time before sorcerers would come and attack Chihiro's house, ultimately just killing his father in the end and taking the six heavenly swords. Now this leads into being a pretty basic revenge plot of, you know, gathering the swords and trying to avenge his father, but Chihiro is different in the sense that he's a quiet hothead who typically does what he wants for his own goal but just stays silent and pretends like he's listening to advice from others. Currently in the most recent chapter of the series, or most recent chapters, they kind of introduce some new characters to help with the greater picture of the plot, while Chihiro is more focused on avenging his father, uh, the newer characters are part of a group trying to be tasked with stopping mayhem from breaking out and preventing things on a larger scale with collecting the swords. And these characters, while they haven't had enough screen time yet for me to get a full opinion on, they all have pretty distinct and kind of zany designs, and they all have their own kind of personality quirks. So I guess time will tell and see if they're kind of going to be memorable, or if they really are just their design being the whole aspect of their character. It's funny because the character that had the most impact for me was his dad, who arguably didn't really have much time but i think he made a good impact of kind of having that single father like ability like vibe going on and his relationship with his son felt very real now since there's only 14 chapters i didn't want to go fully into explaining every plot point that happened but there is some nuance you know there is a character that ends up falling into chihiro's lap that kind of changes the whole perspective of what he's doing because now he has someone that he needs to protect and kind of the ethics of that character you'll see the power they have in a sense it's not really a power more of a detriment for them but yeah it's definitely cooking something it needs some time in the oven so we'll see how things pan out so um, aside from the story i'm glad to say that the art goes really hard effects for chihiro's sword style is really unique and you'll see that it kind of represents the relationship he had with his dad. The other sword that we see in the series, one of the heavenly swords, is not really as cool. It's very basic. It's kind of like an elemental thing going on. For only 14 chapters, there has been a lot of fight sequences, which I guess could be a good thing or a detriment the way you see it because there's not enough time being going relationships between characters, developing them. I think the author just kind of wanted to have some cool set pieces in there and establish more of the power system at first before anything else. With glazing aside though, Kagurabachi is very par for the course. I'm going to stick around and see if anything groundbreaking happens, but I feel like this is a series that would benefit more for being an anime because it seems way more geared for the action than kind of the story at hand. You know, there's no theming that I can gather so far about the story it wants to tell, more or less just kind of a revenge plot because I don't need any monkeys like you in the world that I'm creating. Alrighty, Mama Yu Yu. This video isn't in any particular order, as these next two I'm equally invested to with their recent developments in the story. But Mama Yu Yu is another battle series that takes place in a kind of stereotypical fantasy world where humans and demons exist. Our main character, Coraleo, is assigned the hero role of his world, boasting a sigil meant to defeat the demon lord. One thing to note is that humans and demons live at peace together, thanks to the previous hero creating world peace amongst everyone. Coraleo and the demon lord, 
Ma Mama have very close relationships to Kid the family. But with Coraleo being at 18 at the start of this story, he starts to question his purpose. With no threat looming over the world, what is he supposed to do as a hero? The series very early on has a great twist with not only going the free run route by starting at the end of a long waged war, but also has a character that's not satisfied with his current situation. He feels a little wrong to have this feeling of wanting to have something happen to give his life purpose. That dynamic alone is already so interesting, and that free run reference is only surface level. Find out later on that this is just one world of many, and I mean many other fantasy worlds very drastically different or very similar to the world that they live in. Things differing between like how far time has progressed, civilization, how drastic the war is, whether humans or demons are at peace, who is winning, if the war is already over or still ongoing, and having all these different worlds kind of collide into Coraleo's world not only gives him kind of a purpose now because he has a reason to use his powers to be a hero now he has something to protect against but it's not necessarily black and white you know not every demon that is coming to his world is a foe and not every hero that is coming to his world is a good person and i think it's really interesting how the villain is kind of like this puppet master character kind of colliding these worlds together kind of making this chaotic environment and it's very different from the conflicts in other series where you don't really know what's going to happen and there isn't a clear goal yet for the antagonist of what he wants to do other than him saying that he wants them to kind of fight each other and have certain people develop their sigil skills for god knows what. Like I mentioned before, Coraleo feels kind of conflicted about this feeling he has now, and now that there's something actually going on, he feels weird for feeling kind of happy that his life has purpose. With the sheer amount of heroes and demon lords they're introducing, you would think they would kind of fall flat. But the highlight of this series is honestly the characterization that they have. It is so strong on the first base impressions that all these characters have. Not only is every character beautifully designed around that hero demon archetype, but just the way they speak and the individualism they have speaks volumes of the type of worlds that they're from. The character Minerva alone represents the potential this series can have. She is a demon lord that is an idol in her world, but being an idol is not the way that we see idols, where she has to fight people akin to boxing like a competitive sport while also singing at the same time. There are just so many great out of left field moments that just make me smile from all the subtleties of how the characters interact with each other. Just seeing how Elisa has no idea what a pool is and just calls it an indoor pond, it has no right being as funny as it is. They can play so much off the fact that some worlds are so deep in war and that they have no time to progress to civilizations, and it leads to more comedic situations like that. And yes, the conflict is actually like entertaining and it's not for just the comedy aspect. There is action and it is a joy to read. The heroes and demons are born with sigils on their hands like I mentioned before, which hosts a randomly assigned power that they have at their disposal. There are different markers on their hands that can indicate how much use of your power you have left and it's kind of give or take by each person. The sigils can do pretty much anything the author wants, which allows them to have creative freedom to make any fight as interesting as they want, and the power system is pretty open-ended. With Coraleo's power alone being able to take in powers from the people he's crossed paths with, it just leads to him never really being in a stale position. With a clear plot established to take down Grisha, the main antagonist, and bring everyone back to their own worlds, I can tell that this will be a fun ride, with not only just the fights in stored, but just the interactions between the characters. its It really had so many twists that I didn't see coming. I mean, while the demon and hero interaction aspect is fun as is, there are also some characters outside of that archetype. It's not just the demons and heroes. Um, you have Coraleo's trainer, who's just this badass demon war general guy who's just got all this skill despite his age. And then there's like a character like Ben, who's just this like runaround lackey who's just so deadpan. And the writing of just the characters and the way the dialogue is written is just so nonchalant and lax and it's just it's so funny. I cannot express enough just how much of a gem this series is. And I really recommend that you read it. I didn't even want to go touch into the different characters being introduced or kind of what even happens in the beginning because the beginning has probably the most 
of the plot unravel, while the more recent chapters just kind of goes more into specific circumstances of kind of accruing people together. The most recent chapter is starting kind of the first big arc of the series. With that said, I'm really looking forward to seeing if the author can keep this level of character dialogue, story beats, and just overall quality of just the dynamics of everything in check as the series progresses. So the final series we're going to be looking at is Goku Rakugai, otherwise known as Paradise District. And this is a big one. I'm really happy to say that this is just an overall really good story. This series revolves around our main duo, Alma and Tao, who are troubleshooters that work on solving cases revolving around MAGA. And essentially, MAGA are these disaster beasts that are combinations of dead humans and animals combining, creating these devil-like depictions. Our main duo consists of Alma and Tao, and they have a very fun chemistry together, mainly because you want to know more about their past and why they kind of act the way they do with Tao always ordering Alma and he can't really act on his own so there is that mystery aspect. There are a ton of characters that get introduced even in just these 14 chapters whether it's victims or people reporting cases to them or even just foes or just co-workers. Um, they all have such super distinct designs and personalities. I mean there's literally a talking dog. What else could you ask for? One of the more entertaining dynamics is just when Alma is talking with various clients or people that he meets that he needs to help. He's just super straightforward and always has that motive to try to help others and it just easily makes the new characters that are being introduced just shine all the more. While the series does start out a little more lax with uh, good vibes being thrown around, there is a much darker undertone being compared to anything else on this list. The Goku Rakugai district is not a place you want to set up shop, however, with MAGA abundant and murder on the daily, it is very much a place you metaphorically and literally have to fight to stay alive. The grunginess to the district is what makes it feel very grounded and surreal, but also doesn't completely compare it to our world. The MAGA ultimately don't even have that much of a threat in terms of the story, so it is expected that human antagonists would kind of take over, which I'm glad to say is what ends up happening. It's been really fun seeing how the human antagonists kind of have this connection to the main character, even though he doesn't really know it yet. As we get to see a glimpse of them, it really shows how mentally unhinged they are, and they have this weird binding family complex. Like, I cannot express enough how well the good vibes and the dark subject matter is balanced to where it doesn't cancel out one or the other. Combat so far has just been kind of fine. Obviously the art is just drop dead gorgeous, so it's always a treat to see that. But in terms of like the stakes when fighting the manga, it isn't really there, as you know that our characters can easily just kind of go through any task revolving them. The interesting part about that is that you find on that Alma has kind of something going on that I don't want to get into, but he can't really fight on his own without Tao there. So that kind of creates a unique dynamic where he needs to get better with working by himself. While characters like Tao, who seems kind of abrasive from the outside, she kind of makes everything seem like she's doing it for the money, but ultimately, you know, our main duo wants to do everything for the betterment of the district. So yeah, I don't want to delve into this one much more because I truly think this is a series anyone will enjoy. It's probably one of the more popular series on Shonen Jump right now compared to the other two. For good reason, it's just overall got a high quality bar and I'm really excited to see what happens with the conflict going forward. All I want is $7,000. Look at this bitch. $7,000 for this car. But I got a slight dent in the back. And that's it. That's three random ongoing Shonen Jump series I decided to catch up on. And I gotta admit, I ain't gonna complain. They were all pretty good. I really wanted to make this video to kind of hopefully get an audience's eyes on this so that new upcoming series can kind of avoid the Ayashiman treatment and just kind of get axed out of nowhere despite being an absolute banger of a series. Hopefully this good experience I've had reading digital manga will keep me keeping up with other series that I'm interested in instead of just collecting things physically and only ever reading physically. Also yeah, this is the first video I've ever made on this channel so it's kind of scuffed but I plan to keep making more video essay type content on kind of anime and manga, maybe even some game stuff. 
So hope you enjoyed. Yeah, bye.